evening and welcome to our Good evening and welcome to Artists Talk on Art on January 23rd, 2023. I'm Jacqueline Rada, Secretary of the ATO Board, ATOA Board. Tonight, Doug Shear, our president, will interview the world's leading expert on the life and art of Edward Hopper, Dr. Gail Levin. ATOA is, is the art world's preeminent forum now in its 49th year as a leader in aesthetic panels and dialogues. The comments made by tonight's speakers do not necessarily reflect those of ATOA. This ATOA copyrighted Zoom event is being recorded and will shortly be added to our YouTube channel. Your questions and comments will be taken from our Zoom chat and some of them addressed by our speakers after the program. Our interviewer, Douglas I. Shear, was a co-founder of the series in 1974 and serves as our president. He is an artist, writer, and impresario living in Woodstock, New York. ATOA's historic archive was organized by him. It includes the words and images of over 8,500 artists, critics, educators, curators, museum staff, collectors and historians and was acquired by the Archives of American Art of the Smithsonian Institution in 2016. In all today, ATOA has held over 1000 talks. A, uh, Doug will also serves on the Education and Public Engagement Committee of the Samuel Dorsky Museum at SUNY New Paltz. Doug, I can't. Your turn. Thank, thank, thank you, Jackie. Um, so I'd like to uh, start by introducing Gail Levin, who is Distinguished Professor of Art History, Fine and Performing Arts, American Studies, and Women's Studies at Baruch College and, and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. The acknowledged authority on American realist painter Edward Hopper. She is author of books and articles on this artist, including the Catalogue Resonne and Edward Hopper, an intimate biography. Her work on 20th century and contemporary art has won international acclaim, been widely published and translated in America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Articles range from theory of artists biographies uh, to explorations of the intersection of American and Asian cultural studies. She has also written on the art of women artists in diverse historical contexts. Her frequent focus on women artists and Jewish artists led to biographies of Judy Chicago and Lee Krasner and a major study of Teresa Bernstein. During 2015 and 16, Levin held a distinguished Fulbright chair in India and was a Fulbright specialist in Mongolia in 2019. She also shows her own artwork and publishes fiction. I thought as uh, just a, an initial note before I begin to ask Gail some questions, I would say that uh, tonight's subject is controversial, I'm, I'm acknowledging that at least, and you may or may not agree with the facts or the assumptions made by Gail Levin, but you will certainly learn something new about the Hoppers that you likely never knew. And about the late Reverend Artea R. Sanborn, and also about the Whitney Museum. So please keep an open mind. First, a few words about my own relationship with the Edward Hopper art and downtown New York. I was born in 1944 in Manhattan and grew up in Greenwich Village. First on West 16th Street near 7th Avenue. And then as still a young child, my artist parents and I moved to Hudson Street between Horatio and Gansevoort. We had two six floor apartments, one which was an art studio um, empty of furniture, and that that apartment faced north and west, 
and view the very spot where the Whitney Museum stands today and the High Line Railroad, which was a, a working railroad in those days. Next door was the meat market. The other apartment faced across Hudson Street uh, on the uh, looking toward the east side of, of, uh, of Hudson uh, was a block of two story shops, which I always presumed was the setting for Hopper's famous painting, Early Sunday Morning. Uh, a few years ago, Gail disabused me of that idea uh, and told me that it actually was painted uh, from sketches he did on 7th Avenue and 15th Street. Uh, so I must have seen it for years when we lived there. So between the two locations, it was seared in my memory. This was later reinforced when I was a teenager at Rhodes School, which was on 54th Street, and I had a family pass to the Whitney and MoMA, which was back to back between 54th and 53rd Streets. So I was seeing the, that painting and many other hoppers almost every day. That, that definitely made an impression on me that has lasted a lifetime. And now to discussing uh, some of the points that Gail, I'm sure, would like to make tonight. Um, you, you are charging both the Reverend Sanborn and his family or heirs and the Whitney Museum. Uh, what are the broad strokes of your positions on, on what I would call uh, a scandal? Um, good evening, Doug. First of all, thank you for having me to speak at Artists Talk on Art. And um, I wanna thank all the people who have turned out. I was trying to keep a list and I ran out of space. Um, I just wanna say that I have two emails at CUNY. They're both Googleable online. And I'd love to hear from anyone. Perhaps you won't fit into the time of the chat, but I'm happy to receive your email and continue the discussion. So um, I also want to say that I worked at the Whitney between 1976 and 1984. I um, have continued to work on Hopper, among other things. But I really had put this on the back burner until the Whitney announced on July 29th, 2017, um, that 5,000 papers, Edward Hopper's and Joe Hopper's missing papers had turned up and 4,000 of them were given to the Whitney and another thousand were on loan to the Edward Hopper House, I guess it's a museum or art center in Nyack, New York. So that was really shocking to me. And I wondered, will my biography, my catalog raisonne and all my other writing on Hopper be obsolete because of everything I couldn't see? And of course, um, well, I'll just start now. Um, Sanborn, who lived between, this is um, Arthur Sanborn, a Baptist minister in Nyack, New York from 1955 on. He lived between 1922 and 2007. He had no relationship to either Edward Hopper or Joe Hopper, Edward's widow, Josephine Nivison Hopper, whose existence I have championed since I was at the Whitney, since they wrote her out of art history. I tried to put her back in. Um, so the minister by the New York Times investigative journalist um, who came out with an article last October 19, by their account, and they did not use me, my evidence, they found their own to you know, either confirm or deny what I was saying. They came up with more than 300 original works of art that either are still owned or were once owned by Arthur Sanborn. And yet there is not one document showing how he got a single one of those artworks from Edward or Joe Hopper. And these are artists that kept very careful records in ledgers 
together, Mr. and Mrs. Hopper did, whenever work left the studio, left their possession for sale, for exhibition, or for a gift. And I'm going to be showing you some of that evidence tonight, which is why I asked Doug to discuss the questions with me in advance. He's not limited to those, but I've prepared a PowerPoint because I wanted to share a lot of it. Um, so in fact, I need to share my screen. So that was gonna be my next question, Gail, is uh, I hope that you'll have some uh, evidence and, and points that will support your case. And I'm, I'm sure you do. Yes. And in fact, many of them, the, the best new evidence comes from Sanborn's 4,000 papers, which the Whitney since November 15th has been allowing me to go through. Um, I have also, by the way, asked to see my own correspondence with Sanborn from the years that I was at the Whitney. And the Whitney's lawyer has in writing turned down my request to read my own letters, which I find extraordinary. And my response to him is, what are you covering up? And that's what I want to ask you all to think about tonight, um, what the Whitney is covering up. So um, Sanborn was not mentioned at all in Edward's will. Let me just move this on here. Whoops. Oh, my goodness. Hmm. Why isn't this moving? Can you see my screen? There you go, yes, it's moved. All right, so I wanna alert everyone two things. Um, of course, you're free to take screenshots tonight, but if you wanna see things I'm talking about, I have a website. Here is the, it's got a complex, it's at CUNY Commons. You can always Google my name and CUNY Commons, but up at the top of the screen now, the second line is the address. Gail Levin, as one word, dot commons dot gc dot cuny dot edu slash ethics dash visual dash arts slash. And that will bring you to this screen. And on this website, you will have not only the excerpt I'm going to play you tonight, which is just three minutes, from Sanborn's public lecture of 1982 at the Rockland Historical Society, but you can listen to the whole thing and the introduction. He virtually confesses how he made his collection, um, at least a lot of it, out of the attic of the Nyack uh, Hopper family home, to which he had a key, and he tells about that. So that's one thing. And you'll notice part five are the Hopper's last wills, Edward's and Joe's. Sanborn was not mentioned in Edward's will, um, but he got himself added to Joe Hopper's will as a residual legacy in the last few months of her life. She only survived Edward by 10 months, dying in 1968. So a lot of the evidence that I'm going to be talking about is already on that website, and I'm going to be adding more to it. Um, Are you going to play the audio clip now, or do you want no, to? No, no, when we get to it. Okay. Um, I've got a whole progression here. Why don't I just um, move ahead? I uh, hope I don't have trouble there. So there's Sanborn. It's the only photograph, still photograph I have of him. And I'm gonna play you as later a short film clip that I'm in the same film, though I didn't know I would be. I think BBC used interviews with me for two different films without asking. I probably gave them permission and they just did it. So I never saw this film from 2004 until a colleague from England pointed it out to me. Oh, and a, a review pointed it out in reviewing a current Hopper film documentary, which didn't bother to interview me because it's a Whitney propaganda piece and it's touring theaters. And it got a pan from one reviewer who said this film was better and I'm in it. So, uh, so is Sanborn. So those are the only two visuals of Sanborn himself. Um, you can find pictures of me all over the internet. I have nothing to hide, but I think Sanborn had a lot to hide. 
Um, and I hope to prove that to you tonight. So in this article from the Rockland County newspaper, I, it's on my website, you can get the, the exact title. But this is where he told Louise um, Kreisberg, the reporter, um, it says actually over here, I'll just read it. The, the couple named a NIAC minister, the Reverend Arthur Sanborn of the First Baptist Church as one of six heirs of their estate. Quote, uh, Perens, the Whitney Museum inherited the paintings. Well, this is, a, this is just not accurate. As you can see by reading the October 19th New York Times article, which explains it well, or by going to Edward and Joe Hopper's will, Sanborn is not mentioned in Edward's will, but in Joe's will, um, he's not a sixth of the estate. And Adam Weinberg repeats that in his current um, essay introduction in the current Whitney exhibition catalog. Instead, there were 14 legatees and all the art and property, once it was distributed, Sanborn got himself added on at the last minute as one of six who divide what's called the residuals, whatever's left after the property's been distributed as named, which means all of the art, he got no art whatsoever in the will. And um, uh, funeral expenses and any debts have been paid. He got a sixth of what was left, hardly a sixth of the entire Hopper estate, which included the house in Truro, which went to Mary Schiffen House, um, which by the way had Joe Hopper's diaries, many of them in it, which I used for the biography. Many of those have now been given to the Provincetown Art Museum and um, the Schiffen House family, I would like to acknowledge, has long been very supportive of my work and very generous um, with me. And by the way, the Whitney is claiming and I've heard from a poet recently who wanted to get permission to reproduce Edward Hopper's, some of his famous paintings in a book and said, but I can't afford to pay for them. Well, the Whitney is collecting money for works that are, in my opinion, in the public domain, have long been in the public domain, but at any rate, they don't have exclusive copyright, which they claim they inherited from Sanborn, who in any event, if that's so, can only have inherited one sixth of anything. He told a lot of fibs, in my opinion. Okay. You know, before you, you go on with yeah. what we'll, we can call a kind of indictment, um, it would be helpful to spend just a minute and, and explain to people what your training was, where you went to school, um, and, you know, the things that led up to you becoming the curator of, of the Hopper uh, collection at the Whitney. Okay, I have a visual, yeah. So thank you, Doug. Um, here I am, right when I uh, have been at the Whitney just three or four months on October 22nd, 1976, that's me um, mm -hmm. right there in the center. Um, you can imagine this was my very first um, attendance at a formal Whitney uh, art opening of Ernestage for Alexander Calder. And um, I felt like nobody, I was nobody, but the, the reporter and the photographer from Women's Wear Daily saw an attractive young woman and came up to me and asked me if they could take my photograph. And I said, you don't want me, I just work here. And they said, oh yes, what's your name? <laughs> so that of course created a bit of a scandal at the Whitney because Tom Armstrong, my director, didn't make it in. At the bottom, you could see the heads of Calder and George O'Keefe, whom I met that night, the only time I ever met her, although we corresponded. And there's Virgil Thompson, Marcel Breuer, and Cortez. Okay, so how did I get there? I had almost no museum experience. I had a brand new PhD. Um, I got it in, I guess, May or June, 1976, in the history of art from Rutgers University. Um, my dissertation was on Kandinsky and the American avant-garde, 1912 to 1950. I had a master's degree from, in art history from Tufts University in 1970. And um, I interviewed Henry Moore for my master's thesis 
on Henry Moore and the tradition of the Italian Renaissance. He was the first famous artist I ever met. I have to say I was fearless and uh, in getting these interviews. And um, right after that, I interviewed Lee Krasner, which is recently published at the in the Barbican Krasner Retrospective Catalog of 2019. And I'm also her biographer, but I also had an undergraduate honors degree in art history from um, Simmons College in Boston, now Simmons University, where my honors thesis was on solving the problem of Jan van Eyck and again, ultra peace. So I, I came across um, some little notebooks by the synchronous Morgan Russell in a private collection while pursuing other works for, for my uh, dissertation research. And I was so struck by how it corrected the text of George Hurd Hamilton that I proposed an exhibition to Bill Rubin at, at the Modern at MoMA. And he said, well, we can't afford to hire you, but we'll let you be a guest curator. And they paid me a hundred dollars. And I was already a, um, in an assistant professor tenure track line at Connecticut College. When the Whitney asked me to come for an interview to be the Edward Hopper curator, which seemed attractive at the time, but um, I certainly- <laughs> tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. What was it like in, in that initial first year or so in that position? Oh, well, you can see from this picture um, that it, it seemed very glamorous. Um, Hilton Kramer, the curmudgeonly critic from the New York Times, had given me a great review at, for my little show at MoMA. Mm -hmm. And the interview at the Whitney with Tom Armstrong and Palmer Wall, his um, administrator, they said, this will be the last good review you ever get from Hilton Kramer, which it wasn't. And um, in 1978, I was chairing a session at the College Art Association with Lloyd Goodrich speaking about the Armory Show, I remember that. It was on some kind of avant-garde in America. And Jules Brown from Yale, who was a Whitney trustee and an art history professor at Yale, came running in waving the New York Times. It was a Saturday when the art reviews then came out. And he said, I won five bucks off Armstrong because he, my director had bet him that I would get a pan in the New York Times. So it's pretty ironic for me that um, I discovered this theft, which we're gonna talk about at the Whitney. I wasn't trying to be Nancy Drew. I wasn't looking for it. And um, I was looking for Hopper's papers, which Sanborn, the thief, I call him the thief. And I think I'll convince you. He hid 5,000 of Edward Hopper's papers from the Whitney catalog raisonne for 50 years, even after his death, he got his heirs to keep hiding them. And I ask you to consider, I was in my twenties when I started as curator at the Whitney. I was totally devoted. I thought it was a great opportunity. And um, what cruel person would keep a famous artist entire papers from a catalog raisonne project from the major museum that owns that, you know, was the legatee of that artist. It's a real sicko, I would say. So okay. in, a, in addition to the fact that, that apparently uh, Sanborn and then later on his, his heirs obscured uh, whatever you want to call their behavior, obscured, certainly they were obscuring a lot of important information about the Hoppers, um, which ultimately led you to be in a sort of a battle with the Whitney itself, uh, which eventually cost you your job. But certainly it must have had a very negative impact on the scholarship, not just yours, but on the scholarship widely about Hopper. And it may still be a lasting impact that that's had. Tell us a little about that. Well, I think that there's um, certainly Vivian Freed spoke out about it. And then she's a, a professor emeritus at Vanderbilt and an author about Hopper. And she spoke out about this to the New York Times in the October article. Um, 
there, I think some other Hopper scholars tuning in tonight who might weigh in. Um, but I think there's a level of trust when you work on an artist, you know, from who dies, say within your own lifetime, you think they're gonna be papers and to have someone actively hide them. I'd like you to ask why Sanborn wanted to hide the papers. Why did he need to hide the papers? And I'm gonna show you that tonight. Okay. But why I, didn't he, why did Sanborn need to hide the papers? I'm gonna demonstrate it very carefully. Okay. But okay. I'd like to first point out this is from Joe Hopper's will. And it says, I given um, bequeath all my remaining pictures, works of art, prints, etchings, together with the plates and watercolors done by my husband together with those done by myself and others to the Whitney Museum of American Art. There are only three paintings that she accepts from that. And they're all by her, two by her and one folk art painting. Everything by Edward Hopper was given to the Whitney. It's all works of art, all etchings, drawings, everything, juvenilia. There's even works from the attic from Hopper's ancestors, everything is bequeathed in the, her last will to the Whitney. I had never seen Joe Hopper's will or Edward Hopper's will during the tenure at the Whitney. I only got them after I was fired and was no longer an employee. Okay, so, um, and I just wanna point out, these are the record books that were left. I did have access to three of them, I think, three or four that were left to Lloyd Goodrich um, in the will. So these didn't go with the other papers because they were specified in the will. And we'll look at some detail later, but Joe Hopper kept these. There's um, even a, a kind of an anthology, a selection of pages published by the Whitney after I left. And each um, entry is also published excerpted in my catalog raisonne, but there's one exception, which the woman I hired right before I was fired as my assistant, either omitted or someone censored it. I rather believe someone censored it and that she did not omit it. I don't think she would have. Um, so you can see in the beginning, they were cutting out images. That's um, Hopper's Lighthouse painting from Maine, but eventually, at the top, you can see later on soon, he made record sketches and Edward Hopper also entered notes about the kind of paint and other materials that he used, varnish and so forth. I'm, I'm moving ahead of myself a little bit because I realized that what would be a little more relevant here is um, you've spoken about the things that were conveyed to the Whitney by, by Joe Hopper's will. Um, today, you know, given, given the original catalog resume and also your various writings and also, uh, there's such an abundant amount of, uh, documentaries and there've been so many shows, so many things have passed by over those 50 years. Uh, do you believe that today there are still things that are glaringly missing from either the catalog resume uh, or just are generally unaccounted for that is still having a negative impact on the scholarship and, and the world's understanding of the hoppers? Huh. Well, they're all the papers, plus they're all the drawings. The only drawings I included in the catalog raisonné were either literary or commercial illustrations um, because I couldn't finish by the time they fired me the thousands of drawings, particularly because auction houses and galleries wouldn't divulge the provenance, which to track authenticity, you need the provenance. And so all that secrecy, and the, I think Sanborn got close to a thousand works. Now I could spend my days, I have a lot of photographs counting them, but I prefer to do new scholarship. And all of this, Sanborn theft business has eaten up a lot of my time and denied other worthy artists my attention that that might have been more productive. But I've got to do this. I've, so my motivation is to set 
um, the historical record straight. Now I'd like to show this example of a painting that is called City Ruse from 1932. Um, was, it's the view from Hopper's studio, right when he moves from the back of the building on Washington Square to the front. And I think it's a very personal view that he never wanted to sell, that he wanted to come to the Whitney. But somehow, look at, this is the record book entry. This is the top of a page, so you can see it in detail. Look at the lower left corner. That's Hopper's sketch, zinc white, Rembrandt colors, our colors, poppy oil. The rest of the writing is Joe's. And she writes, here in studio. Sanborn claimed Joe gave it to him. This painting, which is um, worth tens of millions of dollars easily to, in today's market. It, I'm going to show you Chop Suey a bit later, which is from just three years earlier and a couple of inches bigger. So there's no way, and that went for around $92 million mm -hmm. um, in 20. Uh, 2018 at Christie's. So there's no way if Sanborn was telling the truth and Joe gave this to him, Edward certainly didn't, she would have written in the catalog, in the record book, this ledger, give to A. Arthur Sanborn. Otherwise she would know people like me would think it was stolen. And in fact, it was stolen. Now, um, I wanna show you what I found. This is the beginning of the evidence, the new evidence and why Sanborn had to hire, hide the papers. At first I thought he covered up his theft by claiming to be a close family friend and an expert on Edward Hopper. And that would explain why he had so many hoppers. But in fact, um, in the, uh, Sanborn Hopper Archive, as it's called, disgustingly. Um, this is a notebook, and it's the only reference to a gift to Sanborn. And um, it's from 1964 at Christmas. The top one says Lloyd Goodrich and another employee, at, two more employees at the Whitney, actually three, uh, four more. These are two guards. Uh, at the Whitney, Marie Appleton's the secretary, Margaret McKellar, kind of a curatorial secretary assistant. And, oh, and I think this is the coat check guy. I knew these people. And Eddie Brady was the handyman on Washington Square for NYU. John Clancy is um, Hopper's dealer. Um, Dr. McClellan was their GP. And there's Sanborn right here where my cursor is. Uh, she's written out Arthur Nyack uh, Baptist Church. And what is it that they've given all these people? The only gift recorded to Sanborn. And this is what it is. It is a mass produced photomechanical reproduction of Edward Hopper's Lighthouse at Two Lights um, that is still available. You can buy these. Maybe it was worth $5 at the time, maybe. Um, so I found that extraordinary. Joe was so careful that she recorded this not once, but twice. There's one list and then she copies it over into a notebook. Oh, by the way, this is me um, about three years into my job at the Whitney. Um, if you can just imagine how young I was at the time, how naive, how innocent. I didn't know anything, but I was very productive as a scholar. I worked probably 60 or more hours a week, um, worked at home also. Uh, this was my first exhibition catalog book published by George Braziller for the Whitney. And I never got a cent for any of these uh, writings. I did the whole catalog myself, big exhibition, included Sonia and Robert Delaunay. I won't go into why. They weren't American, of course. And I, the only one of my shows that was co-curated was this one, which traveled to the Johnson Museum at Cornell, where the co-curator was, and to the Cebu Museum in Tokyo. 
and it got re it was so successful that Cornell University Press reprinted it after the original sold out. And so here you see, uh, this is who they fired. Not only did I finish the catalog raisin except for the drawing volume, took them 11 years to publish it, but I did the book, The Complete Prince of Edward Hopper. They're still selling and making money off Edward Hopper, um, The Art and the Artist, which is my, the catalog of my 1980 show. Um, and for the 1979 show, Edward Hopper Prince and Illustrations, there were two books, pu all published, the ones in the top, all four of them by W.W. W. Norton. And this one is from a touring exhibition that went to Germany and Italy. It's Edward Hopper, The Formative Years. Oh, and it also went to Wales and Scotland. Gliani Formi TV in Italy. Okay. Um, so they fired somebody enormously successful with great, even superb reviews, very prolific and um, just, you know, very productive. And I got fired. So, so I'd like to take 30 this minutes to get out yeah. of the museum yeah. on the pretext that I had published a little book on Hopper for Flammarion in Paris and Crown in the US for which they had given me permission but I was so dumb, I didn't know that it was a pretext to fire me and I didn't have it in writing. But they uh, fired me mm -hmm. immediately after I reported Sanborn's theft for the second year in a row. Right. And I, I, know, I, I wanted to get at with you, if we can, um, over, over these, over particularly the years in which Sanborn was still alive um, and you had, uh, I, I guess I would like to know a little bit more. I think people would like to know a little bit more about your interactions with Sanborn or his heirs over the 50 years uh, and how early that began. What was the first uh, meeting or, or contact? Okay, just let me just move on. This is the okay. book that there's the Whitney's still selling with a new cover and mm -hmm. still making money for the Whitney, not for me. Still in print from W.W. W. Norton. Um, okay. Lloyd Goodrich. Yeah, we'll get to him. But okay. what did you just ask me? Um, well, I, I think my relationship think, to Sanborn and his family. Exactly. And how okay. early did that? What was the first? Oh, well, in my first month on the job, I oh. get a call from a guy who says he has a collection of Hopper, would like to bring it to me, bring it in and show me. And it's our, he called himself Reverend or Thayer Sanborn. And, um, he shows up at my office. He's age 55, deeply suntan. It's late June, my first month on the job. He's dressed in Bermuda shorts. He's carrying a giant suitcase, much too big to carry on a plane, filled with Edward Hopper's early works and some letters that he wrote home from Paris, which convinces me that the works, they look like works at the Whitney from Hopper's boyhood that they're likely authentic. Um, but he wanted me to authenticate them and I was, and put them in the catalog raisonne, which I was not prepared to do at that time. And of course I would need record photographs. Um, so I probably was a bit, I mean, I didn't give him exactly what he wanted, but he, I did cooperate. And I think, let's see if I can find a picture of that. And we can come back to this because oh if you don't mind me just to get in there again uh in that original suitcase you're saying that there were works of art by hopper um there are hopper works and there are hopper works in terms of their relevance and their importance let's say in that suitcase, did he actually have oil paintings of Hopper? You know, I don't recall that, but he might well have had some small one, early ones okay. since he owned about the first nine in the catalog raisonne at one time. But I think they would have been hard to transport. And mm -hmm. the thing is, I had many more meetings with him and I only saw the tip of the iceberg that first day. Mm -hmm. It took him years to reveal everything he had 
And then he actually wrote to my editor of the catalog, Raisonne, you know, the person at W.W. W. Norton that I worked with, um, Jim Mars, the late Jim Mars, wonderful guy. Um, and he sent him a, um, a list of all the things I'd omitted from the catalog raisonne. Basically, Sanborn was complaining about me. Um, this, by the way, is the exhibition Prints and Illustrations, where I first compared Hopper's system with uh, his later mature painting, you know, 30 years later, Office at Night, 27 years later. I never put them in a show together because I had the oil paintings and drawings to uh, one year after the show of Princeton Illustrations. But today's show at the Whitney, Edward Hopper's New York, shows them right next to each other. Basically, they're following my scholarship, which was considered controversial by Hilton Kramer at the time, who said I would confuse the public. So the Whitney doesn't give me any credit, but there, are, and I also did a, an article, I had forgotten about it, I just found it for the LA Times Magazine, which was gonna be called Edward Hopper's New York, but they changed the name to uh, Sunlight on Brownstones, I think, mm -hmm. uh, back in 19, early 1990s. Um, I think that's right, might be earlier. Anyway, um, so you asked me. Well, we can we can go on. Uh, I think that. Uh, oh, this is what I wanted to show. Yes. OK. So how I got roped into authenticating that first few months at the Whitney when I knew so little. I mean, believe me, I knew very little about Hopper. You know, I mean, I knew more than the average person, but I was no expert. So I was asked by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts to render an opinion on the authenticity of this early Edward Hopper self-portrait from about 1903, which looked like some the Whitney had in the bequest and was being offered to the Museum of Fine Arts by a preacher friend of the preacher, Arthur Sanborn. Now, the museum was offered at the same time by the same preacher, William H. Britton, now deceased, like Sanborn. The, this drawing, early opera drawing from 1900, um, is a cell phone photograph that I took, I was allowed to take at the Museum of Fine Arts. It's in their file, but they turned it down. So Sanborn claimed at the time and in writing, the letter is in the MFA files, that he gave this oil painting to the Reverend Britton, his longtime friend, because Reverend Britton's wife liked art. So the Boston Museum of Fine Arts bought it from Britton for $27,000, making it a, in 1976, one of the most expensive sales from Sanborn's theft, at least that I knew about. There's no way that Sanborn was, with four children was giving um, I think he still had four surviving children. He wasn't giving away $27,000 to a friend casually. I believe that he was using Britain as what's called a fence, so not, as not to call attention to people like me who would be suspicious. Now, why do I think that? Because I now have proof, and it's on my website, that Sanborn was selling anonymously at auction particularly at Sotheby's, um, within a year of Joe Hopper's death. And uh, why was he selling anonymously when, if he was really a friend of Edward Hopper, the works would be authenticated by that fact and be more valuable because he had to hide it because he stole the work. Um, I wanna use the method of compression to try to crunch together some of the questions that I had developed and we have been talking about. Yeah, uh, can I just show this one image? For the sake of time, but all right, show this image and then I want to- uh, This is an example of what was sold um, on March 19th, 1969. 
So it's literally a year after Joe dies, Edward is dead, and it's a prize winning image uh, called Smash the Hun. Edward won $300 for it, and it was a contest by a journal, um, trade journal for the shipping business, uh, the, uh, the Morris Dry Dock Dial, that even got him the model. There's no way he would have sold this to him or given it to Sanborn. He surely wanted this at the Whitney. There's no way he would have let it go at auction. And there can only be one person who could access it from the attic and that's Sanborn. So while so, I don't have so I, absolute I, proof, if yeah. the attorney general would force uh, just Sotheby's, this was Sotheby Park Burnett, we would know. Right. You just beat me to the punch there, Gail. I was going to say that, uh, you, you know, I think you've made a pretty strong case that something untoward, something not quite appropriate happened. I'm putting it very mildly. But, uh, you know, if it were in the hands of the attorney general or some other body like that in investigating it, um, what do you think they would find ultimately uh, was at some time in the hands of Sanborn and his family and eventually made its way to the Whitney. Do we have a way of putting our arms around um, the size of this, if you want, for lack of another term, case? Um, Doug, very little of the art Sanborn stole of those 300 to 1,000 artworks has ended up at the Whitney. In okay. fact, I only know of one painting uh -huh. plus the 4,000 papers, which have a few doodles in them, okay. but are not major works of art. Right. But all of these images on the screen now, which are Edward Hopper's printed commercial covers for magazines, mm -hmm. many of which are in the current show. Right. Um, these I showed as art in Edward Hopper Princeton illustrations in 1979. They are now being dismissed as ephemera by Adam Weinberg, the director of the Whitney, yeah. so that it doesn't seem like the Sanborn gift is returning stolen art to the Whitney. It's okay. just ephemera. But sure. I showed it as art and I borrowed but, it. From so, I think the point that I'm trying to get at, and I, I recognize that some of it may be unknowable, I understand, by you even. Uh, if there are, as you're suggesting, loosely speaking, hundreds of Hopper paintings, paintings on canvas and maybe other artwork, uh, you know, whether it's prints or whatever, but certainly, uh, yeah. So where I'm no, getting no, at this there is- not a, There are fewer than 100 paintings. Fewer than 100 paintings. As okay. through Sanborn, I believe. And of okay, course, I but, can't know about every one because right. it went- uh, right anonymously at auction, but right. there, are, there are hundreds of drawings. And lest you think, oh, they're just juvenilia, which is what um, Adam Weinberg is claiming. Right. Um, let me find, sorry, I have to flash through this. We got out of order. Um, here. Yeah. First of all, juvenilia. So this appeared at Christie's. Sanborn got hundreds like this. Right. And this was resold, not by Sanborn, but whoever bought it from Kennedy Galleries that originally got it from Sanborn. That I'm certain of. And this is a drawing, is that correct? It's a drawing of roughly 14 and a quarter by 22 and a half inch. Mm -hmm. And it's in the current Whitney show, people can see it. They claim it was executed circa 1915. I don't know how they got that date. I okay. suspect it's later. And it sold in 2016 at, at Christie's for um, 2015, sorry. 437,000. Yeah, isn't that amazing? That's not uh, juvenilia. I, I would not think so, no. And he has hundreds of those. Right. And okay, now there's something really important here. Mm -hmm. Where do I have it? No. 
right here. Okay. People might know um, the late Brian O'Doherty, who just passed. Yes. yes. Um, his essay on and his TV interview with Edward Hopper, and he and Barbara Novak, his wife, ingratiated themselves with the Hoppers. Mm-hmm. Although Barbara and Brian were very critical after Edward died of Joe. In any event, um, Joe recorded their gift on February 17th, 1966. And I've actually seen the drawings in the home of the, the O'Dorities. Um, Two nude drawings of nude models from the Whitney Studio Club. So from before Edward and Joe were married when he still had other models. And it says two female nudes drawing given to Brian and Barbara O.D. by E.H. Thursday, February 17th, 66. Sanguine drawings, unframed, inscribed to each. This is such important evidence. So this is just, she's gonna die just over two years later. And clearly she was still recording gifts of Edward Hopper's artworks, even two drawings. So are we to believe that she gave Sanborn hundreds by the New York Times, more than 300 by me, close to a thousand? Not one of them is inscribed. Not one of them was recorded. Really? Does anybody want to believe that? Because I think no, I, well, I, I'm going to say also that we haven't touched on this yet, that Sanborn, while he was alive, and particularly early on after Marion had passed, uh, or even while she was alive, that, that's Hopper's sister, had unique access both to the Hopper house in Nyack and also to the Washington Square studio. Uh, and apparently even after uh, after Joe had passed and after Marion had passed, the Bank of New York, who were the executors of, of, the, of Joe's will, um, basically gave Sanborn a key, or he had a key. Oh, he had the key. They let him keep it. All right, he had the key. Let him keep this it. This triangle on the upper right is the attic where all the art was stored. Right. Right. Ancestral art and Edward Hopper's boyhood work and mm-hmm. all his commercial work right mm-hmm. here. Right. And today it's the, the art center and they've named a room for Sanborn, whom as far as I know is only the family's only loan. They've given nothing. Right. Um, so what I'm trying to do tonight is to preserve some time for Q&A. Okay, and let me. So, let, and so I know me. that I know that there are some additional clips you'd like to show. I'd like to including, play this. Including the, uh, the SoundCloud uh, three-minute piece of Sanborn. It's ready uh, here. Okay. Wait a minute. Whoops. Oh, no. Yeah, here we go. The only reason I went into the attic, the first was, and, and the reason I had access to it, because I had a key. This is, this is the minister's side of the story. So you can believe it as you want to. But when Marion was living there alone, I was the only one who had a key to her house. So I could go in and out at my choice. But the reason that I had to have a key, I bet I had to, was to think that Mary and I had an affair. You had to know Mary to know that that would have been impossible. Uh, the only reason that I had a key to the house so I could go in and out and not disturb her was that when I got her a television just to get her off of my back and to loosen her up and to sweeten her up a little bit, then she got so engrossed in these these uh, soap operas that I couldn't go in the house and she couldn't answer the telephone, she couldn't answer the doorbell. So she had to give me a key. So when I went in to check on her, I could get in without disturbing her. And she'd fidget all the time I was there because she was missing some of the story and she didn't care anything about what I had to <laughs> while I was checking her. But I did have a key. But then uh, after, and I kept and took care of the property for Edward and Joe while they were alive. And then I took care of it for the bank of New York while they were the executives and so on and so forth. So, but one day my son and I were in and I said, well, I don't know, there's a dead bird here. So we get in somehow. So we better explore. So we went up this rickety old ladder with, you know, half the things going in. Been there since Edward was a boy, I'm sure. They never replaced anything. Uh, the, the, the paper on the wall had not been done in 40 years. And she had lived there, you know, as if it was a mansion. Well, anyway, uh, we went up the ladder didn't break our necks, we got up there and we began looking around. It was a treasure trove, unimaginable, of 
of all vintages, you know, and I'm particularly interested in the things that he had said, rocks. I have a collection of rocks. In there. Some of these things, I feel like that bottle that he found out in the Hudson River that somebody had thrown over in 1898, and he saved the note that was in it. And the note was still in the bottle. And the letter that came back from the people. Uh, upstairs, I think there is a... Um, uh, the bowl of a, a pipe of a Hessian that was taken at Christmas in 1776, and they made an ink stand out of it. And the note is still in it. Someplace in all my collections, there is a nail out of one of the churches that was torn down. And they saved everything. But uh, newspapers, uh, uh, this was his first studio. And uh, lest I don't get to this uh, when I get uh, further along, uh, I want uh, you to be, be sure and see, and if you haven't seen uh, this Whitney book of the catalog that uh, of the show that was just here, I'm going to leave these up so if you want to look at them later. That's but this is a picture of his first studio, which you can't see way back there, but if you're interested, you can go out after it. This, is, uh, this was in the Huckabee Quest. It is an oil that he did in that attic uh, when he was very young, but uh, uh, the picture uh, on um, um, that was on the easel. Uh, the, e the, the paint box underneath is, is on another ex exhibition tour, so it's not here, uh, but I have that. That's the one on which he has his picture drawn on the on the cover with his E Hopper Esquire and so on and so forth. A dream, a dream of a boy whose roots were growing and expanding unseen, because roots unseen. The minute you begin to see a root, you better be careful. Because you know when they become exposed, the roots become exposed, then you're in trouble. So you better get them buried. The the roots are hidden, but the roots were already here. But this is such an interesting picture because I have this easel uh, at home. Uh, I have the picture that's on there uh, that he painted. Okay. So that was the Reverend Sanborn, and to whom was that sound? Uh... That was at Rockland County Historical Society mm -hmm. on July 22nd, uh, 1982, for the 100th anniversary of the Hopper's birth. I wasn't invited to it. There was no internet. I didn't know about it. He didn't want me there. Right. Um, okay. And I do want to quickly get in that Sanborn, when I after I was no longer at the Whitney in 1995, when Alfred A. Knopf published my biography, you see it now, um, Edward Hopper and Intiman Biography, Sanborn wrote to them. He claimed copyright infringement for letters he owned and images he once owned. And he thought he owned the copyright. And the lawyer, having been forewarned, asked him to document how he came to possess these things. And he said, Edward Hopper kept no records. He did everything with his agent with just a handshake. And so I withdraw my claim. And that's where, this is the big revelation from the Sanborn archive. This is what Gail Levin didn't know in all my years of working on Hopper because I had no way of knowing how completely obsessive a record keeper Edward Hopper was. There are, I don't know if it's a dozen or more notebooks, more of Edward Hopper in Edward Hopper's handwriting um, in the Sanborn Hopper archive. Here you see, and I haven't finished going through it, but here you see a list of the medicines that he took in 1966 and what he paid for them. Here you see another a notebook with um, the galleries he's going, to, he keeps every gallery he visits and what art he sees. This is Krauschauer and you can see um, Richard Leahy, Gifford Beale, et cetera. And this, this is really amazing. From 1936, daily weather records, whether it was sunny and the temperature and where the wind was from. Now this is obsessive. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's move to, uh, if, if you were the prosecutor in a case against either the Sanborns or the Whitney, um, what is it that you feel you would like to achieve in what's your goal right now in bringing so much public heat against the Whitney and against Sanborn 50 years later uh, what would you like to see achieved? What do you think is achievable 
Both I would them. like Sanborn's name to come off the Hopper archive and off the room in the Edward Hopper house in Nyack because naming, um, even if he weren't a thief, even if he found the 5,000 papers on a, in a garbage can to have withheld them from scholars for 50 years, the man is sick. And, but that's not the case. He was covering up the theft of hundreds of original artworks. And this, by the way, are two notebooks that the Whitney bought in 1996. And I think they gave money to Sanborn. I suspect that they were from Sanborn. They won't say where they got them, but there wouldn't be any other place. And I know of another one they don't have and don't know about that passed from Sanborn to Kennedy Gallery to a private collector. And I know where it is. So I would also like the IRS to investigate Sanborn and the Sanborn Family Hopper Trust. I don't believe they pay proper taxes. Um, we haven't mentioned that Yale University Art Gallery has 17 drawings for the 1958 um, Sunlight in the Cafeteria painting. So those are not juvenilia and there are many more like that, but this is easy to see on the internet. And part of those were given as a gift by Sanborn who had no connection to Yale, but I know this from the Whitney, there's a, a scheme where when, and Larry Fleischman who bought and fenced, um, laundered it's called, a lot of the stolen Sanborn artworks also laundered stolen antiquities for his own collection and gave and sold them to the Getty, which has had to return a lot of them to Italy and maybe Greece, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I would like the truth to get on the historical record. I would like some of the money from the Sanborn sales to go back to the Whitney, a cleaner, more ethical Whitney, so that they could use it um, to acquire new work for the Whitney uh, to benefit the public instead of the Sanborns. I consider Sanborn a complete immoral, illegal thief. And he's gotten away with one of the art crimes of the century. And he's very Gail, clever. Gail, don't hold back. <laughs> uh, so what I, what I wanted to ask though is, isn't the, isn't the, and this is a question, it's not a, it's not a statement or, a, or an accusation, it's a question. What's the role of a museum that receives work under such sort of cloudy, I'm trying to be generous, cloudy circumstances, uh, that could it possibly make them uh, into a kind of uh, uh, complicit party? Absolutely. Uh, and I have a slide here about the, uh, here, the code of ethics from ICOM, the um, International Council on Museums, um, that states in part, quote, acquisition, disposal, and loan activities are conducted in a manner that discourages illicit trade in such materials, and, quote, competing claims of ownership that may be asserted in connection with objects in its custody should be handled openly, seriously, responsibly, and respect for the dignity of all parties involved. Well, I didn't get that dignity when I discovered this theft. Sanborn got plenty of assistance from the Whitney. And one of the things that Weinberg writes in his catalog essay is that the Whitney was negotiating with Sanborn and his heirs for more than two decades. And that the negotiations were started by a woman named Anita Duquette who was the rights and reproductions manager when I was at the Whitney. So I think, the, and actually my first assignment uh, at the Whitney was to, by Tom Armstrong, was to write an essay for this guy, Larry Fleischman at Kennedy Galleries for which I was paid an extra $250 on top of my 16,000 a year salary. So it was a big deal. It's my first publication on Hopper, but it's on, and Lloyd Goodrich published the Whitney uh, Director Emeritus in the same catalog. It's unheard of for a museum 
to take it serious young curator and have them write for a commercial enterprise. It's just not done. It's unethical, but I didn't have any choice and I didn't know any better. I was only maybe four months on the job. And in fact, I was called to a meeting on Yom Kippur and I'm Jewish and I was forced to come to be told that I had to write this. It's crazy. But um, yeah, there's a lot of unethical stuff. I would love for the Whitney to have to open up its books. The idea that they won't let me see my own correspondence that I wrote with Sanborn, I find extraordinary. Okay. I, um, I don't I don't see a lot of questions. Oh, I'm starting to see a few. I, uh, I want to point out how the, the Sanborns claim they got mature work out of the Washington Square studio. Mm -hmm. You see Edward Hopper in front of this chest of drawers. That's right. a Dutch antique. They were allowed to buy any, they alone, they claim, of all the six residual legatees could purchase anything they wanted for a total price of under $100. And Mrs. Sanborn told me that underneath the dresser drawer, the drawer linings were stacks of Hopper's drawings. Okay. Well, if that's true, our Thayer Sanborn was a residual legatee, had a copy of the will, which I didn't. And he knew that these things, these drawings belonged to the Whitney. So how could he keep them in good conscience? I would say that's theft, but I don't even believe the story. But he said he had the key. Okay. I hope. I we're hope we're beginning to have some questions coming in, so let me address some of them to you. Okay. From Susan Chevlov, uh, do you think that all the material that came into Sanborn's possession was from the attic? No. If so, okay. If, hang on. If so, did the executors of Joe's estate simply not inventory, or were they not aware of the attic contents? Do you think the contents were intact when Joe passed? They were intact up to a point when Joe passed, but Sanborn also, as I just indicated, after she made her question, got into the Washington Square studio, both to visit Joe when she had glaucoma and cataracts and a broken hip. I think he walked out with the, the painting City Roos under his arm, if you wanna know what mm -hmm. I think. Uh -huh. But, um, and by the way, he got every one of Edward's caricatures of Joe that she was so proud of. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, that she gave a Baptist minister um, a drawing of herself by Edward Caption, there is a virgin, give her the works? I don't mm -hmm. believe it. Or the sacrament of sex, female version? I think she wanted these to be seen at the Whitney to represent her and her importance to Edward. But mm -hmm. Sanborn still has these. And I have a film clip. Um, I can just post it on my website. It's probably not worth taking. If we okay. have time, I'll play it. Um, Harris Fogel to, to you. I just want to say that Gail is my hero. <laughs> um, so you haven't offended everyone here tonight. Um, uh, from Babs Ringold, are you working with lawyers at this point? No, if you know any that will help me, uh, pro bono, I can't really mortgage my retirement on uh, suing the Whitney, or even better, if you have a connection to the New York State Attorney General or the FBI, It'd be great if they would take this on. I'm not looking to benefit. I just want the truth out and I'd like the public to benefit. Right. There are a number of people uh, uh, heaping praise on you. I won't bore you with that, except that there are several. But you'll give me uh, copies. Huh? <laughs> you save yeah. copies. Thank you. Okay. Either way, uh, were the executors neglectful? Yes. You don't let the fox go into the hen coop to gather the eggs. And they let Sanborn go into the attic. There was a letter at the Archives of American Art. After um, Edward died, Joe inherited specifically, they were given to her all the Paris pictures that are now at the Whitney. Mm -hmm. She wanted them out of the attic. And um, I think that's right. They sent Sanborn in to get them. Right. And, uh -huh. 
you know, it's like the truck in the garment industry, the proverbial truck that a lot of things fall off along the way. Right, right. They fell into uh, Sam Martin's knapsack. Right. Katerina Pierre, who, who might be someone you know at CUNY, I think yeah. it was Whit the Whitney's loss and CUNY's gain that they fired you, meaning that the Whitney fired you. Many CUNY students have benefited from your advice and knowledge for many years. I think you have the, you have the makings uh, of a great memoir here, personal memoir. Uh, they can't sue you about a story involving your own life. It, it should be a mega bestseller. Well, if you know an interested editor or publisher, let me know. Uh -huh. It's amazing how timid agents and publishers are to take on an institution like the Whitney. I, however, am unafraid. If they sue me, they'd have to let every truth come out. And that's the last thing they can afford. Right. Uh, from Helen Harrison, who, who we consider a friend of ATOA, of the, uh, you know, of the uh, uh, Paula Krasner Foundation, uh, volunteer lawyers to the, for the arts, which I think I mentioned to you at one point. Um, I don't uh, think they'll help me because I'm still gainfully employed as a distinguished professor at CUNY. I think my income is considered too high. Well, I, I, I disagree with you. I think you should look into it. Okay, know, thank and you. And let them, let them let you know. Okay. Um, and we have you, Artist Arc and Art has gone to them on, on a number of occasions. Uh, in fact, they led us to a pro bono law firm, an international firm that helped us when we were negotiating with Smithsonian. Uh, so they, they, they really can supply very top flight people. Um, uh, Bonnie Claus, how could the Whitney make reparations? They could take Sanborn's name off the archive. Uh -huh. Um, they could make a public apology. They could tell the truth. That would go a long way in my book. Uh -huh. um, uh, they could apologize to me. Right. Uh, uh, Susan Chevlov again. Sadly, there is probably a statute of limitations. Um, do you think that's a factor in this? Well, for criminal charges, it might be. And anyway, mm -hmm. Sanborn's dead. But yeah. the family still has a trust with a lot of art in it. All yeah. the caricatures. Every time I do more Hopper scholarship, I make everything they own more valuable. Right. And for right. Whitney, I wanted to show this. Yes. Um, let me just get to it. Um, whoops. Here. City Roofs that I showed you is mm -hmm. now been bequeathed to the Whitney. Because right. like Rauschenberg's Canyon, which has an endangered species bird in it, right. it couldn't be sold. And who's going to pay tens of billions of dollars for an Edward Hopper that the author of the catalog raisonne says was stolen? So basically, I made it unsaleable. Uh -huh. Somebody unrelated to the Whitney bequeathed it. And I'm happy that it's at the Whitney where it belonged. And I just hope for a future Whitney, which has um, a higher level of ethics than the one today. Uh, Harris Fogel, I'm on the peripheral, uh, I'm only peripherally involved with a case where a colleague and friend's work has been removed and kept from the sole family member. Uh, there are finally lawyers involved, but once work is in someone's possession, even if unlawfully, it's incredibly difficult to set things right. What a shame. Well, besides, um, at least the papers are now accessible, at least four-fifths of them, and um, if the truth is on the historical record, maybe this won't happen again, but it's certainly a warning for all artist estates, especially those without children, to mm -hmm. take extraordinary precautions to make sure that the will is drawn well, because the Hoppers wasn't, and that your executor is reliable, and the Hoppers was not. Uh, a, a note from Babs Reingold. Uh, Todd Levin was the person that alerted the FBI about the fake 
Basquiat painting shown in Orlando, maybe it would be interesting to have a conversation with him. Is he a, a lawyer or a curator? Or? That's a good question. Who is Todd Levin? It sounds uh, familiar. I don't, I don't know. Someone in the art world. Yeah, uh, he's an art consultant, according to Babs. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, and there's a note here from Katharina Pierre saying, uh, and I'm losing it. Where is it here? Okay. That, uh, thank you, Katharina. That Pierre. Jack Flam alerted the FBI in the Nodler case. Mm. Thank you for that. That's that's a good reminder. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would like to see the public do? Either people in the art world, people at, at other museums, uh, just as you know, just as for example, the uh, somebody at the Supreme Court unknown outed the the planned overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, are there some people in the art world that uh, or in the press that covers the art world? They could be doing more to uh, accelerate. Yeah. Yes, I'll tell you, it was heartbreaking for me. I was trying to get the press. The New York Times was the only press that responded. Um, Hyperallergic commissioned me for 50 Andrew Word article last June. They accepted it on July 4th, and then they failed to publish it. Uh -huh. And I believe they were paid off by the Whitney, though I cannot prove that. That's what in my heart of hearts, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I would appreciate it if everyone talks about this, keep it before the public eye and write about it if you're an art writer, um, keep, it, keep it alive. I'm struggling to do that. I'd like to point out another drawing in the current Whitney show, which was given to Hopper's patron, B. Blanchard. And you notice it's inscribed to my friend, this is John O. Blanchard, and it's recorded as a gift in the gift list in the record books. Mm -hmm. The point I want to make is there's so much proof of how the hoppers operated. And the Sanborn hundreds, no matter how many hundreds of original artworks, there's not a shred of documentation mm -hmm. only for the photomechanical reproduction. Who could possibly believe that? Why does the Whitney think the public is so uninformed and not inquisitive and is going to believe their buckum? Uh, another comment from Bonnie Claus. I would love to see the Whitney digitize and place online all of the, uh, no, it just bounced out of my view. So cool. All of the so called Sanborn materials online and accessible to scholars. They're doing it, Bonnie. There's, yeah. They're okay. doing it gradually, but there's already <laughs> some of it online. And I just couldn't wait because I don't know how long I'll be around. And I've been waiting since 1976 to see these papers, but they are doing it. I also want to give a shout out, I don't know if he's online, to Lewis Shadwick in London, who um, outed um, Sanborn's claim that this painting that he talked about um, is the ice pond in Nyack, which is, I believed him, so I was naive, and it's really a copy as he, that was in a magazine hopper, maybe, maybe subscribed to, um, by the American painter Bruce Crane. So Sanborn led me to make art historical error, and I do not forgive him. I trusted him. So Gail, uh, in trying to wrap this up a little bit tonight, let me say that uh, I think that uh, you you have a new role in life. Not only are you the definitive curator and source for everything Hopper, which is by, its, by itself an astounding place to be, but you're also now one of the art world's great whistleblowers. And I would say, you know, uh, that's a special place to be as well, if you think about it. Thank you. We forgot to mention my whistleblowing about the Whitney's erasure of Joe Hopper. They oh, yeah. discarded all of her stretch canvases, and they've gotten a Whitney shill, I call her, to publish that they still have them. 
So they've only the only two have been found, this one in a private collection and this one that the Whitney's regained, but they've look at the accession number 70, and yet it was in a hospital collection with a lot of with 92 other works for decades. And this shill actually claims that these works were gifts, were not gifts, but were loans. And that's simply not true. And I can prove it. Here's the papers for the four that went to New York University. And you can see they say gift of Whitney Museum 1973. And this one is still visible on view in the Hopper studio now belonging to NYU. So the Whitney is lying big time or you call it misrepresenting, but they keep doing it and they know better. They know much better. So what can you trust at the Whitney? That's what I'd like to know. And of course, one of the missing is one of my favorites. I only know it in this black and white photograph, Edward Hopper reading Robert Frost. But if the Whitney has Joe's stretch canvases, let them show them, let them put them online, let in color. <laughs> yeah. Because they don't have them. And they would have they would have gotten quite a few, I mean, hundreds of things that had been Joe's, right? Yes. And they're showing three watercolors in the current show, plus two more in the catalog. And of the three in the current show, only one is from the Whitney Museum collection. The other two were from Sanborn, and they're on loan or either given to the Opera uh -huh. House in Nyack. And I went up and saw 40 in that show. Can you imagine of Joe's watercolors, only one given to Sanborn, we're to believe, only mm -hmm. one was signed. So I think it was an unfinished portfolio that he stole and none were inscribed. So, I mean, this other friend of the Sanborn's so-called friend by the New York Times, claims that there were about a dozen with ARS in a Joe Hopper notebook that she gave him watercolors. I haven't found that notebook, but if it exists, and I believe it might, um, if she could um, record you know, gifts of her work to Sanborn, she surely would have recorded gifts of Edward's work to Sanborn, right. but there weren't any. Right. I turn things over to Jacqueline Rada. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doug. Jackie. Doug. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Well, ATOA would like to thank Gail Levin and Doug Shear for a most stimulating, uh, incredible evening uh, and hearing about this, this uh, amazing um, situation that's ongoing and hopefully it will continue to be ongoing if Gail can you know continue her amazing work on this and um, exhausting as it, it might be and it sounds like it has been pretty um, you know pretty exhausting for you and but stressful. please save and, the yeah. chat for me and anybody with any ideas for me to pursue or any further questions please email me at gail.levin at baruch.cuny.edu or g11 at gc.cuny.edu and if you can't remember them just google me I get both emails daily. Thank you all for your supportive comments. Mm -hmm. And and again, thank you. I personally can tell you that I really learned so much tonight and I have a completely different opinion. I didn't I didn't have an opinion before, but it, you know, I, I didn't know what you, this was just so enlightening. And I really think it was I think we will talk about it. I will. <laughs> you can you can rely on me, Gail. Anyway, um Again, thank you both. And I'd like to also thank our many board, board members, advisors, volunteers for all of the work they continue to do with, with Artists Talk on Art. And especially thank all of you for attending tonight. And hopefully we'll see you again, like next Monday night. And if, and anyone, that, has, if anyone has a documentary filmmaker, I'd really love for this to be a film. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank both. you. Thank you all.